Okay, for those who are watching this on video, welcome to our Sunday morning New Horizons class. We are in the Explore the Bible series, the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations. This is lesson or session number three. It's titled Personal, and we're in Jeremiah chapter 7. So Jeremiah chapter 7, session number three, titled Personal from the Explore the Bible series. Can we get a light on in that room? Uh, the light on in that one, you have to turn it on by going through the hallway there to get it. It's right at the back of the door there. Thank you. Okay, since this is session number three, let's take a quick look at a couple of review points from sessions one and two. Session number one, we kind of introduced the book of Jeremiah. We talked about Jeremiah's background. He came from a Levitical family, from a priestly family. He was born and raised in one of the Levitical towns, which was a town of priests. He was called by God to be his spokesman at a young age. He was probably late teens, early 20s when he was called. And like many of the other prophets of the Old Testament, his initial reaction was, you got the wrong guy. But again, like many of the prophets of the Old Testament, God touched his mouth and said, no, I have the right guy. I'm going to put my words in your mouth you're going to go where I send you and you're going to speak what I have told you to speak. <coughs> then last week we took a look at Jeremiah 2 through Jeremiah 6 which is kind of an opening um, lament in that it, it kind of opens up the themes that Jeremiah is going to talk about throughout the rest of the book. So for instance in Jeremiah chapter 2 through 3, first part of 3, it's a long lament by God about how things used to be. And if you remember from last week, God laid out for Jeremiah to tell the people, we were once really close. You were once faithful. You were once my covenant people. But you have turned away from me. You have gone your own way. From there, in chapters 3 through the first part of 4, God calls His people back to repentance. And like many of the other Old Testament prophets that we've looked at before in this time period, that call was ignored. And then in chapters 4 through 6, God kind of lays out, okay, we were once close. We are no longer close. You have left me. I, I've called you to repentance. You have said no. And therefore, there's judgment coming. And if you'll remember, God actually said the judgment is going to come from the north, which would have been the Babylonian Empire, which later in Jeremiah's ministry towards the end of it, the Babylonian Empire does come in and capture uh, much of Judah and destroys the nation as a nation. And that's where we're going to pick up today. We're going to, to expand on some of those themes from chapters 2 to 6. And we're going to look at what's called Jeremiah's temple message. But as we get started, you knew this was coming. Question for the day. John's laughing over there. There's always a question of the day on Sunday morning. Why do people go to church? Why do people go to church? Okay. Because they want to serve God okay. and believe in God and pray. Okay. They want to help each other. Okay. They want to be cheerful givers. Okay. Doug? To glorify the Lord. Glorify God? 
Fellowship with others, strengthening in your life, Christian life. In worship. All the other things. There have been multiple surveys done. Many of you may have heard of a guy named Barnum, who does a lot of religious surveys. And there have been other secular surveys done, asking the question, do you go to church? Why do you go to church? The most recent surveys that have been done since the pandemic would tell us that fewer and fewer people are going to church. In fact, after the pandemic, many, many hundreds of smaller churches closed their doors and never reopened again. Why do people go to church? Well, if you guys will remember in 2020 and 2023, we did the church survey as we were looking for a new pastor. And we talked last week in the business meeting, I mentioned about the characteristics that we were looking for in a pastor based on that survey. What you may or may not remember was there some questions that were asked about, why do you go to church? What do you like about what happens at First Baptist Church, North Kansas City? One of the questions specifically asked, why do you go to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City? And probably not surprising, from 2020 to 2023, there were 126, I think, people who took the survey in 2020 and 16 who took it in 2023 because we really were just looking for those who hadn't taken it before. Not surprising, the top four answers of why people come to our church were the same. And in order, top to bottom, here were the top four reasons people come to our church. Number one, fellowship and community. Number two, the preaching. Number three, worship. And number four, small groups. Many of the things you guys said when I asked the question initially, why do people go to church? Community. We are not meant to be Lone Ranger Christians. Preaching. We need to hear God's word. We need to have the strengthening as we go forward. Worship small groups we need the big community we also need the little community question is though as a secondary follow-on question how does going to church affect your life six days out of the week that you're not in church <clears throat> That's really the question Jeremiah is going to present to the people of Judah today. Because the people of Judah were very religious. The forms of religion they had down. But as we found with those minor prophets that we looked at a year or so ago, and as we're going to find out in Jeremiah today, it really didn't impact their lives. They had the rituals down. They knew the right words to say. But they didn't necessarily act like their words talked. I've heard many, many times that for Christians, for not believers, a Christian will be the only Bible they ever read. Your actions many times speak louder than your words. And that's what we're going to look at today. Jeremiah chapter 7 through about chapter 10. God left off at the end of the last session with the judgment that was coming. 
And one of the things that he talked about in Jeremiah 2 was the fact that the people had left their relationship with God. They were no longer following the covenant. In 7 through 10, Jeremiah 7 through Jeremiah 10, God through Jeremiah is going to lay it out. He's going to talk about how they have left that relationship. And it really boils down to three major themes. The first one is they had completely forgotten the worship of Yahweh God. Do you remember last week we talked a little bit about how the God of the Exodus was the God in the past. And the present God is the gods that were in their country. So we're going to worship them. So one group of people just basically they said, Yahweh God, he's the old guy. We're going to worship the new guy. Others just took the pagan worship and incorporated it into Yahweh worship. So the temple had other altars besides the altar to Yahweh. And others spoke all the right words, did all the right rituals, and six days a week they ignored everything else. <coughs> they lived their life without any um, connection to God's commandments. So in today's session, Jeremiah 7, we're going to see Jeremiah standing at the temple gates because everybody came to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. That was the site for worship. And he's going to lay it out for him. This is what you are doing wrong. Part of the bigger section, but not the focus today. Jeremiah 8 and 9. God lays out the judgment that is coming. In Jeremiah 9 and 10. He talks about the results of that judgment. Judah would be destroyed. The walls in the city would be leveled. The temple would no longer exist. But Jeremiah 7 verses 1 to 15, our focal passage for today, is called the temple sermon because Jeremiah literally stood at the gate of the temple and preached. I don't think it's quite the same, but kind of the picture I get is the sidewalk preacher we used to see in city streets. And honestly, in Jeremiah, most people ignored Jeremiah. Probably Jeremiah preached this uh, message, this lament, this sermon about 18 years into his ministry. So. He's already gone through a couple of kings. He's on about his third king at this point. And people are not listening. In fact, God has told Jeremiah, quit praying for the people. Their judgment is sure. I am not going to repent of my judgment. So don't ask me anymore. But Jeremiah is still preaching and calling the people to repentance. So Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 1 through 15. Let's start with 1 and 2. Um, Frida, would you read Jeremiah 7, 1 and 2, please? This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people, people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. Okay. Verse 1 says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. God doesn't always wait for people to call on Him. Sometimes He has something to say and He tells it to someone and that someone then speaks for God. That was the case here. The people were not calling on God. Jeremiah was speaking for God because God had put the message in His mouth and said, this is what you need to tell the people. The message, the timing, the location were not Jeremiah's choosing. 
They were God's choosing. Verse 2 says, Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord. Well, the temple was located, Jerusalem was located in the northern part of Judah, up close to where the old boundary used to be between Judah and Israel. So most of Judah was to the south. So everybody who came to worship came to the temple, and they had to come in probably the southern gate to the temple complex. That would have been the easiest place for them to enter. So everybody, most everybody in Jerusalem and probably anybody else coming from outside of Jerusalem would come in through that southern gate. So Jeremiah picked the place where he was going to have the highest visibility, or God picked for Jeremiah, the place where he was going to have the highest visibility and everybody was going to hear the message. Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and then call out this word. Or if you have New International, I think it says proclaim the word. The Hebrew word here says loud and boldly. Again, I think of the sidewalk preachers who are nothing if they're not loud. That's the picture I have of Jeremiah. I don't see him standing on a box or something. He's standing at the gate of the temple. But he's loud and boldly proclaiming what God has told him to tell the people. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who enter through these gates to worship the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. This is not me talking to you people. This is God talking to you. Now the folks coming to worship probably did not expect to hear something from God. They were coming there to do the rituals and do the praise and the things they would normally do in a worship service. They were not expecting to hear a direct word from God. And here's Jeremiah at the gate as they're coming in saying, listen up guys, here's what God has to say for you. And it's not just to the leaders. Previous to this and some of the other chapters that we looked at, he's talking to the priests, the prophets, the leaders, and he'll come back to them. But this message is for every Tom, Dick, and Harry, or Mary, Martha, that comes in the gate. It's for everybody in Judah. And when he says here, he doesn't mean listen and let it go in one ear and out the other, which is really what we usually do if you're around a sidewalk preacher. You just kind of ignore them. The word here means pay attention, listen to the words, the sounds, and then you need to act accordingly. Three to eight. Oh, Doug, would you read three to eight, please? Yes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your and your doings, I, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, "The temple of the Lord God of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these." For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings. Thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. If you do not oppress the stranger and fatherless and the widow, and do not shed the innocent blood in the in this place, or walk after other gods to do your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place the land that I gave you to your fathers forever and ever. Be behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Okay. Verse 3 says, This is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says. So again, it's not me, folks. You're hearing this directly from God's mouth. Pay attention. 
Correct your ways and your deeds. The word for ways here in the Hebrew refers to how you live. What's your philosophy of life, if you will? And then when he talks about deeds or actions, depending on your translation, they're talking about the things you actually do to implement the way you live. So it's look at, God is saying through Jeremiah, look at how you live your lives. You're coming to the temple. You are worshiping me. Does your life, the actions that you do on a daily basis, does it reflect your worship? Correct your ways and your deeds, and I will allow you to live in this place. The place here can refer to a couple of things. Depending on who you talk to, who commentary you read, place here can refer to the temple, because they're coming into the temple. But if you look down in verse 7, he says the similar thing, but he's talking about the promised land. Talking about the actual nation of Judah. So probably, me talking now, I put them both together. Because God is saying, correct your ways and your deeds and I will allow you to live in this place. If you repent, if your actions reflect your words, then you can still worship in the temple. And later, you can still live in the land. We know later they lose both. The temple's destroyed and they're exiled because they fail to heed the words. Number four, do not trust deceitful words chanting, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The prophets, the priests, and the leadership we're basically telling people, everything is just fine. They selectively cherry-picked verses out of what we would consider the Old Testament, but out of the Jewish scripture. They cherry-picked scriptures that would seem to indicate that God would never allow his people to be exiled or his temple to be destroyed couple of examples in Psalms 132 God says that I have selected Zion and Zion is another word for Jerusalem I have selected Zion or Jerusalem to be my dwelling place I'm going to dwell in the temple there in Samuel second Samuel God told King David there will always be an heir from your lineage on the throne of Israel and in the past, God had saved them. So the people, based on the interpretation from their priests, prophets, and rulers, said, didn't matter what we do, we can live however we want to. God's got it all under control. We have the temple. Therefore, the temple's going to protect us. God's in the temple. I'll remind you that in one of the other prophets that we studied, he saw God's glory leave the temple. But what the people were hearing, everything is just fine. There'll always be a lineage, a king from David's lineage on the throne. God will be in Zion. We're going to be fine nothing's going to happen and the temple is standing there. So that proves our point. Instead, verse 5, if you really change your ways and your actions, if you act justly towards one another, and again, when it says change, that doesn't really convey the meaning of a word in Hebrew. When it talks about change here in these verses, it's not that just change. It means radical change. It means an intense 
180 degree turnaround kind of change. You have a choice. You change your ways and your actions. You act justly. And again, remember those minor prophets? One of their biggest messages was you're not acting justly to people. Change your ways and you can live there. And then he gets specific. Verse 6. If you no longer oppress the alien, the fatherless, the widow, and no longer shed innocent blood in this place or follow other guards, gods bringing harm to yourselves. You go back and look at the law in Deuteronomy. The fatherless, the widow, the orphan were all called out by God in the law as deserving special care from his people. They were ignoring it. They were not taking care of those less fortunate. The alien were those who were not Israelites but lived in the land. And again, the law in Deuteronomy says they deserve special care because you were once aliens. Shed innocent blood. Again, think back to our study of the minor prophets. Again, one of the biggest messages from the minor prophets were the courts are corrupt. The rich paid off the judges and they got the rulings they wanted. And the poor went down. Verse 7, I will allow you to live in the land. So here's the other interpretation of place that, back in verse 4, I will allow you to live in the land, to the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. Again, remember again, Moses, Abraham, all the patriarchs, God said, this land will be yours forever. Verse 8, but look, you keep trusting in deceitful words that cannot help. Folks, you keep ignoring me and listening to those leaders that are telling you the things you want to hear. There's a verse somewhere that talks about itchy ears. I don't remember where it is offhand. But, you know, your ears itch to hear what you want to hear. They did not want to hear God's message to Jeremiah. In fact, we get further in, Jeremiah gets beaten, he gets imprisoned. Uh, if it could happen to somebody in the bad way, it happened to Jeremiah. Nobody wanted to hear that things were not just going peachy keen. Things were going downhill. No matter how clearly God spelled it out, and here in a minute in these next couple of verses, he's going to spell it out even more. The people ignored it. So, He's been kind of specific in these verses, but in verses 9 to 11, he gets even more specific and ties the people's actions to the Ten Commandments. Oh, Carly, could you read? Verses 9 through 11. Okay. Jeremiah 7, 9 to 11. <laughs> Do you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known? Then do you come and stand before me in this house that hears my name and say, We are rescued, so we can continue doing all these detestable acts? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. Okay. In the last couple of verses, he's talked about relations to other people. The poor, the widow, the fatherless, the alien. Now he's going to get real specific. He's going to tie it to the Ten Commandments. Verse 9 starts off, Do you steal? Eighth Commandment. Do not steal. Do you murder? Sixth commandment. Do not murder. Do you commit adultery? Seventh commandment. 
Do not commit adultery. Swear falsely. Ninth commandment. Don't swear falsely or perjure yourself. Burn incense to Baal. Second commandment. Worshiping other gods. Follow other gods that you have not known. First commandment. No other gods before me. Can't be more specific than that. That is one, two, three, four, five, six. He's named six of the Ten Commandments and tied them specifically to what the people have done. Basically, it said to them, you come in and worship, but then you violate all of these commandments. You do the things that you have specifically told in the Big Ten you're not supposed to do. Then you come and stand before me in this house, call by my name, and insist we are safe. As a result, you are free to continue doing all these detestable acts. We come to the worship of God in the temple. We do the rituals. We do the sacrifices. We do the things you've told us to do as far as worship. Therefore, we can live however we want to because the temple is here as our guarantee that we are safe because you dwell in this temple. And we are safe. Whatever we do doesn't matter. You will protect us. Verse 11. Has this house which has been called by my name become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. I remember when I read this, I think back to Jesus cleansing the temple. And if you remember, he calls the temple a den of thieves. Here, Jeremiah calls it a den of robbers. I've always viewed it differently than Jesus' statement. I've always viewed it differently than the way this commentary talks about it. And I'm kind of conflicted. I'm not sure which I like better in the way of an interpretation. I've always, me, interpreted Jesus saying, you've made my father's house a den of thieves, as saying, all these merchants out here are robbing me. That the thieves were the merchants who were giving short shift for the sacrificial animals and the money changing. The guy who wrote the commentary for this lesson points out something, honestly, I'd never thought of before. God calls this a den of robbers. Jesus called it a den of thieves. What's a den of robbers? Robbers or thieves don't commit their acts of evil in their den. The den is where they go to for safety. It's where they go to hide from the law so they don't get yeah. caught. And the way he interprets this, and I'm not sure which two I like better, or if they both make sense, but what God is saying through Jeremiah and what Jesus may have been saying is you worshipers who failed to follow God's law, come here to hide from God and others seeing your evil acts. Again, think of the verses just before this, where God is saying to them, you do the worship stuff, but you don't act like it outside the temple. Notice the end of verse 11. Yes, I too have seen it. Even though you have come into the den where you think you are safe and nobody can see what you have done, I've seen it. You cannot hide from me. I see everything. You cannot hide from me. Your sins have not gone unnoticed. The fact that you do not follow the commandments in your daily lives has not gone unnoticed. 
And therefore, judgment is coming. 12 through 15. Frida, would you read those? Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to, to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in that you trust in the place I gave you to you and your fathers. I will thrust you from my presence just as I did all your brothers, the people of Ephraim. Okay. But return to my place that was at Shiloh. Okay. Uh, there's a map on the wall over here that talks about key events at Shiloh. Uh, I'm not sure if I think the back of your quarterly has that particular map. It may show Shiloh. I'm, I'm not sure. But if you'll remember back earlier, Shiloh was where Samuel was headquartered. It was where Eli and his sons worshipped. It was where, when the Israelites crossed the Jordan and first came into the Promised Land, it's where they established the tabernacle, was Shiloh. It was, if you will, the first temple. Even though it wasn't a temple, it was a tent because it was the tabernacle. But it was located at Shiloh. And if you refresh your memory, because I'm <laughs> I looked, so I know the memory here. Um, Eli's sons took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with the Philistines. And if you'll remember, God said that your sons and you, talking to Eli, are all going to die because your failure to worship properly, to lead people in worship properly. Well, they took the ark into battle with the Philistines, kind of like a good luck charm, yeah. and they lost. Everybody was slaughtered. The ark belonged to the Philistines. And while it's not spelled out in Scripture, historically, we understand that once they took the ark, they actually came and demolished Shiloh. So the original place of worship was no more. Now we know eventually the ark ends up in the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, they, I don't think it ended up being too good for the Philistines. It didn't end up being real good for the Philistines. They gave it back to the Israelites please, quickly. Please take it. <laughs> uh, but because the Israelites failed to properly worship, God demolished the first place of worship. So he's telling them, take a field trip. Go look at what happened at Shiloh, which would have been two or three hundred years before this. Check your history, folks. What happens when people fail to follow my commandments? Return to the, my place that was at Shiloh, where I first made my name. See what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. Now, because you have done these things, you've done the same thing, folks. This is the Lord's declaration. And because I have spoken to you time and time again, I sent you prophet after prophet after prophet, and you don't pay attention. What I did at Shiloh, I will do to the house that is called by my name. The house in which you trust. You trust that temple. Eli's sons trusted the ark. Both are going to be flattened. I will drive you from my presence or I will thrust you. Again, the word means physical, you know, sudden push. I will thrust you. I will drive you from my presence just as I drove out all of your brothers, all the descendants of Ephraim. Ephraim was the biggest of the ten tribes that made up Israel, the northern kingdom, who had already been scattered, had already been exiled, who were already gone. God basically said to them, you trust in the temple. You think that because I have said I will dwell in the temple, that there will be a king in the line of David, that you are safe? 
But the same thing that happened at Shiloh, because people did not obey the commandments, the same thing that happened in Israel, because they never had a good king, if you'll remember. Yours has been delayed a little, because you've had some good kings. But your time is coming if you don't repent. If you don't make the actions of your day-to-day -day life reflect the worship that you do on the Sabbath day. Stories like this are in the Bible for a purpose. That purpose is just like Jeremiah tells Judah, remember what happened to Israel. Remember what happened to Eli's sons at Shiloh. It's a reminder to us our actions in worship should be reflected in how we live our daily lives. It should be a reflection of what the commandments tell us we're supposed to do. Not only the Big Ten, <coughs> but all those little ones where it talks about taking care of the less fortunate. Again, I'd refer you to the New Testament and Jesus' comment about the sheep and the goats. If you've done it unto the least, you've done it to me. If you don't do it, judgment awaits. Sermon's over. <laughs> Anybody have something to add? So Doug? I said something about, you know, we come to glorify glorify God, but I think it's, I come to also remind myself of how I'm supposed to live my life, and uh, also to get a break from the world on Sunday, and I, also I come on with my ministry, and get a break from the world, and to worship with people that, that, that you know, the trust in the Lord, and it's just, oh, it just revives me times of the week that reminds me and keeps me grounded in the morning. I think of Wednesday as my midweek boost yes. to face the rest of the world. Yes. It's kind of like if we don't come. I can't hear you, Bill. It's kind of like if we don't come and get together with you. We can watch this online. Yeah. But that doesn't do anything for me. Maybe it does the rest of you. I need to sit here with the rest of you because I'm accountable to you. And when I go out and I stumble, and I think, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Because I have to face these other Christian friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've done something wrong. I, it, it just it keeps me boosted up. Being in a group helps to hold us accountable for what we do. It, it's only I can survive. Mm -hmm. I have to come to church. I don't see you ever do anything wrong. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> We're not going to start counting here. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message from Jeremiah. Help us to take to heart that our actions six days a week should reflect our worship on the seventh. That we don't trust in the church building. We don't trust in the rituals that we perform, the songs that we sing, sitting in the pew to be our salvation, but that our salvation comes from you and that that salvation should be reflected in how we treat others help us to practice this on a daily basis now go with us as we leave today keep us safe may we be back together again next Sunday we ask it in your name Amen. Amen. Amen.